back in the olden days before I was saved and I was touring with the some of the really famous new age teachers, I was learning about a concept called law of attraction from them. The first one who taught me about this was Louise L. Hay. She's passed on. She was my publisher for over 20 years. And she told me all the time, your thoughts create your reality. Your thoughts create your reality. I remember that was a little foreign concept to me, but coming from Christian science, it kind of made sense because in Christian science, we were taught your thoughts create your health or not. So why not your whole reality? And then I toured with Deepak Chopra for a long time, as well as Esther Hicks, who was made famous from the movie The Secret. And Deepak Chopra, I remember, uh, we'd be backstage listening to him, and he would go on and on and on. I'm sorry, but he did, and we would kind of we would fall asleep sometimes because he would talk about quantum this and quantum that with his um, his special Deepak way of talking. How does matter create mind? I would posit that actually matter doesn't create mind because there is no substance called matter. Matter is a human name for human perceptual activity. And just like uh, the model of matter, when we get to quantum fluctuations, it disappears as a thing and becomes a fluctuation. So too, what we call matter is condensed mind. Possibly uh, the quantum mechanical body is everything that we call mind. And let the universe organize its fulfillment while you stay, stet while you stay, stay settled in the field of infinite possibilities. That is the yogic way to create abundance this and that and then esther hicks who's so sweet i love this woman and i pray for her uh the channeler of this so-called entity group demon group really the abraham and she would talk about law of attraction in time you have all answers to all questions and the first question we want you to ask is who am i and our answer is you are god and the next question we want to hear from you is, and how am I doing? And the answer that we want you to hear is, you are doing exceptionally well. You are right on track. And the next question we want you to ask is, how can my life be better? And we say, seek things that feel good to you when you focus upon them. And the next question that we want you to ask is, how am I doing? And the answer is, exceptionally well. And the next question we want you to ask is, what will come next? And we say, whatever it is you choose. And the next question that we want you to ask is well will you not choose for me and the answer is we are choosing with you but we are not choosing for you and when you are in vibrational alignment with that which is us the choices that we make together are those choices that we all intended when you made the decision to come forth into this physical body to begin with it's closing the gap solving the separation becoming one with who you are in your joyous endeavor and then being the God in physical form that is natural to you you are the creator of your own reality. You are the God that is the creator of worlds, you see. Don't be humble and try to make yourself apart from that. Embrace it and accept it and ride that wave. And then there was a lot of others that I toured with from the movie The Secret. But, you know, this is something that doesn't measure up either biblically or in reality. And you'll hear from my guest today about both of those things. We're going to be talking with our brother in Christ, good friend, John Clash today. John is an entrepreneur. He is a philanthropist. He and his wife, Gio, live in Puerto Rico. He's originally from Yonkers, New York. So you'll hear the New York accent, but also the New York humor. And his book that just came out, The Law of Attraction, A Gateway Drug to Spiritual Heroin. And you're going to hear why he called it that, because it's that is on point and accurate. Uh, is, this book is filled with his uh, unique sense of humor, which I think you'll like, especially if you're like a Seinfeld fan. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of sarcastic, but it's on it it's it helps it moves the story along. It's actually entertaining in the book. Um, so, John, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Doreen. I appreciate you so much. So, same here, brother. This book is what I love is that you went into research about this so-called scientific 
I'm just going to call it garbage yeah. about how quantum physicists have discovered that our thoughts create our reality, kind of justifying everything that Louise Hell Hay taught. And so you researched that, didn't you? Yeah, I definitely did. What were some of your findings you can share with us? So uh, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go through every single different interpretation of quantum physics and how they compare and contrast with each other. Uh, and mostly because I'm a layman when it comes to this whole subject of quantum physics. And that's actually something that they bank on. They bank on the fact that less than 1% of all PhD graduates graduate in anything quantum physics related. So what they do is they word salad these Deepak Chopra word salads, spit them out at you. And because you and I are what I call uninitiated into the quantum woo gang, we have no idea, we have no foundation for uh, justifying or or coming to conclusions with, is what they're saying accurate or is it nonsense? Because we don't know what quantum physics is. So as I dove into this, the number one thing that bothered me the most about the whole quantum physics equals law of attraction is true thing is that there's so many different interpretations of quantum physics. So there's at least 14. And then from those 14, there's more branches out of different interpretations within those interpretations of why things happen the way they do at the quantum level. So the, the number one thing that they always go back to is something called the double slit experiment. And as basic as I can put it, it's uh, another thing, one of the things that they that derives from it is called the observer effect. So this double slit experiment says that when you observe a wave particle, it collapses when you observe it. And when it's not observed, it does something completely different. And that's like the, the most basic way I could put it, like third grade reading level. Uh, it's difficult to speak in quantum physics as, as a third grade reading level. But then they say that, oh, since there's an observer that needs to be present, that means that they make this crazy leap. I would call it a quantum leap into, oh, because this experiment shows that an observer needs to be present in order for this wave particle to act differently. Therefore, our thoughts create the whole entire universe. Like, I don't know how they get from <laughs> that observation to that interpretation, but that's where the issue lies, is observation is not interpretation. What happens is we observe what happens, and this goes for all science. You observe what happens, and then you interpret with, with the information that you have, you interpret what you think could be going on here. And you'll see uh, quantum physicists all around the world, some of the top people in the field, they disagree with this interpretation that an actual human being needs to be the observer. They'll say that, oh, what, well, what happened before, you know, there was life on the planet? What, what did anything exist? Or did it have to wait until this these one celled organisms showed up or did they have to wait until somebody with a PhD showed up to make the observation? Then it goes on to this, uh, you'll need an infinite regress of infinite regress of observers. If an observer needs to be present in order for something to exist, then somebody needs to be observing that observer in order for that observer to be observing something for it to exist. And then that creates an infinite regress of observers. Okay. And it's just on the surface, when you hear somebody say this stuff, you're like, wow, that's really deep. That's interesting. But when you peel back the layers, you realize that they contradict themselves within yeah. one sentence. And that's the best way that I can put it. I am not a quantum physicist. I even make it clear in my book that I am no expert. But what we can do and without, uh, you know, pulling the the appeal to authority fallacy mm -hmm. and, and and saying, oh, well, because this quantum physicist says that this is the incorrect interpretation. You know, that's not what I'm doing here. But when it comes to something like quantum physics, you and I and anybody picking up The Secret or a book from Esther Hicks or Deepak Chopra, we have to bank on the authority when it comes to this simply because 
most people are not quantum physicists. So when you look at what the majority of quantum physicists are saying in comparison to what these handpicked quantum physicists, like a John Hagelin, mm -hmm. who doesn't even work at a at an accredited university, what they're saying about it just doesn't line up to what the majority of quantum physicists agree with. It doesn't. And the folks who teach this or taught it in the past um, often would boast about their success and you could have this too. And yeah. this was something that I remember Louise Hay telling me, she said, nobody's inspired by someone who's homeless living in a garbage can. And so she would talk about her Rolls Royce that she had. It was don't, it was given to her though, but I guess she hmm. thought she manifested that. Law, law probably, probably. And, and then I want to just show this clip because the, the new age boasting about the success as a way of, they they call it inspiring, but it's really to sell books. You too can be like me. It's a MLM scheme as we'll get into, but yeah. look at this clip, John, from Jesse Duplantis and he's a oh, so-called Christian uh, preacher. And look at him bragging that he has the biggest house in Arkansas in this clip. I live in the biggest house in the state of Louisiana. I have the biggest house of any preacher in America. I don't mean that arrogantly or pridefully. I have a name in my house, La Maison de Reve, the house of dreams. You like going with the wind? My house has that same staircase that Scarlett O'Hara walked up. Oh, I paid cash for the home. Well, you want to know how big it is? It's 40,000 square foot. And he's boasting. And this is something, of course, the prosperity preachers use to say, well, if you sow a seed, which means give me money, then God will bless you like he's blessed me. And they totally just gloss over the fact that the way that the, that Jesse Duplantis got this huge house or Kenneth Copeland got his big jet or the law of attraction teachers got their fame and wealth was because people bought tickets to see them to learn how to do this and they bought their books yep. so it's a pyramid scheme isn't it yep they are they aggravate me so much um it's it's like when you just look at the people that are in their congregation right it it's levels to that as well if you're in the inner circle it's like you're more rich you're sowing more into the into their um into their quote unquote ministry if we could even call it that maybe just for tax purposes they can call it that but besides that it's not a ministry um it, it's it is like levels to to like he's at the top and then he's got these these leaders right and then those leaders have you know their little groups and then those groups and there's also a chain of sowing that goes up because you can sow to those leaderships, those lower leaderships as well. And then those lower leaderships are paying the the Kenneth Copelands and the the um Jesse Duplantis. And I just it it makes me sad and angry at the same time. I'm I'm sad because for many reasons. One, they're just wrongfully depicting what it what it means to be a Christian to the whole world. These are the most popular people when it comes to quote unquote Christianity. They're the ones that when people are like, oh, yeah, I can't stand Christians. Those are the ones that they think about is those guys. And then uh, I'm also saddened because there's people who are in their audience, in their congregation, week after week after week, not only just in their congregation, but in their online congregation as well, sowing and sowing and sowing with this expectancy to reap a hundredfold what you've sown. And even though you have not received that yet for years and years and years, you're diligently, diligently sowing, just waiting for that breakthrough, that, that breakthrough to happen. And it never comes. And they just keep promising that this is going to be the year. God gave me a prophetic vision that this is the year that when you've been sowing uh, diligently for the past five, 10 years that this next year is going to be the year where you have to sow even more because following this year is going to be your breakthrough. And then it's just, it's so manipulative. So it, yeah. it saddens me that people are caught up in this. And then it angers me because they know what they're doing. 
I, I have no doubt in my mind that Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, and any name in the bunch, that they know what they're doing, especially somebody as arrogant as Jesse Duplantis. Like you can look at a Kenneth Copeland and be like, I think that guy's just crazy or or infested with demons or something like that. But Jesse Duplantis, he'll just be in front of his congregation like, oh, yeah, you know how I got this watch? I got this watch uh, from this person for $30,000. There's somebody's house on my wrist right now somebody's house on it. And you got people in your congregation that that are, are struggling to pay rent on a $600 a month uh, section eight uh, supplemented apartment. And you're over here like, yeah, I got your whole entire life on my wrist. I just, uh, the, biblical, the biblical qualifications for being an elder or an overseer or a bishop just thrown out the window mm -hmm. and they can just do whatever they want. But to me, that's, uh, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't have to fall in line with that because I don't think that they're actually preachers. I don't think they're actually Christians. So, you know, maybe that could be their loophole knowing that they're not Christians. So they don't fall in line with the biblical principles of, of what it means to be an overseer. It's just, it's so criminal to see these promises, these false promises that are given, whether it's a new age audience or a so-called Christian audience. And they're all the same, aren't they? It's, it's all so from, similar. It's all it's very similar where Satan works through a person and says, you know, you you give to that person and then you can get. And this whole idea of your thoughts creating your reality, it bypasses the fact that God is sovereign and God right. is creator. And I for me, what really cured me, John, was when I read the book of Job for the first time, especially the latter chapters where God's speaking. To Job, and in essence, I'm paraphrasing, says, Where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Where were you when I filled the ocean? And that really shook me up because until I read that, I had bought into the law of attraction that's, I want to call it the lie of attraction, right. that said that I could control the weather. I was like that crazy, who was her cat, Kerr, who goes out to hurricanes and says she can stop them. Um, I make a ruling that storm will leave this area, will leave the coast. I will not tolerate its presence anywhere on the coast of Florida. And I am commanding it to leave and get back out in the ocean. At the same time, it will dissipate. So I command the millibars in that hurricane, you rise right now. You keep rising and rising and rising so the storm will be downgraded, downgraded, downgraded. And then I'm commanding a hide to come and sit on the storm so it can be crushed. So here I go. I'm going to command that storm and I'm going to hit it off of our coast. I'm going to hit it out to sea and we're going to crush it with our authority. And that's how passionate you need to be. You watch and see that storm will dissipate. I was involved with shaman who we all thought we could do what's called weather magic and we could do quantum, I don't know what it was, but we we thought we had the power. In fact, we'd play that song, I Got the Power, and dance to it. And the <laughs> it, it was so arrogant and prideful looking back. You were caught up in it too, weren't you? This book is deeply personal. Yeah, yeah. I was super caught up in it. Um, so I got into the law of attraction um, through personal development. See, I'm I'm an advocate for personal development to an extent because personal development helped me realize that because uh, I used to be a really negative, angry, violent, horrible person to be around. I don't even know how I kept friends. I have no idea how I did it. But um, when I got around people who seemed to be more positive and were in a more positive environment and they pointed me to like John C. Maxwell and and these leadership books and they really helped me because I'm like, wait a minute, I I was under the impression that I am who I am and there's no way I could change anything about me. So learning that I could change and change the way that I think and that that could change my life from a practical standpoint, standpoint, changing the way that you think does affect your life because your thoughts affect your emotions, your emotions affect your actions and your actions affect your results that you have in life, right? But what happens is that it's also a doorway so as the law of attraction is a gateway drug to spiritual heroin, personal development can be a gateway drug to the law of attraction because it, it goes from these practical steps to now, hey, 
this is how science works. So yeah, they're teaching you all this stuff in these books over here, these practical steps of how, you know, emotional intelligence is important and, and leadership skills are important. But look over here, look, science says that we actually create our reality with our thoughts. Your thoughts are that powerful. They're TV transmitters. They go out into the into the universe and you attract back whatever it is that you're thinking. So you are totally in control of everything that happens in your life with your thoughts and with your speech. And so when you start hearing that, and especially when you're in a financial pursuit as I was, you know, I'm in network marketing, MLM, and I'm just pursuing. And at that time, I had moved into an apartment, got laid off, Pretty much the day after I moved into the apartment, I was eating ramen noodles every single day and sleeping on a cot that I used for a music video. So I was open to opportunity. And long story short, I had a lot of success, relatively speaking, uh, pretty quickly. And then what happens in business is you hit these plateaus and where you know things aren't moving as they once were. That initial momentum slows down. And this happens in all businesses, whether it's MLM or traditional businesses. It's just the cycle of, of business. I had no idea that this stuff happened, that business slows down. So when it slows down, I go into panic mode, right? And when I go into panic mode, I reached out to some of the, the people who are more successful than me, trying to find some practical steps I could take in order to kick things off again. And what I got was, you got to listen to the secret. You got to do the law of attraction. And I saw the movie years before this, but I got excited about it, then forgot about it the next day. And then when they brought this up to me saying, oh yeah, well, your business is moving slow because you got to watch the secret. You got to listen to the secret. You got to read the secret. I was like, oh man, how could I have forgot? I forgot that my thoughts create my reality. So that's what got me really into it. And I went on recruit mode. I was recruiting everybody into the law of attraction. I wouldn't entertain even one little tiny sliver of negativity. I wouldn't even entertain critical thinking because that's what they tell you. If, if you if you think critically, thinking critically, all it is is looking at the pitfalls of what it is that you're doing. What are, what are some of the issues that you have in your life where you're lacking that you can fix? and take practical steps towards fixing. But that's not what they teach you. They teach you to ignore that and just focus as if it's already fixed, as if you're already living, thriving in that area. And so it creates this delusion. And I'm, I'm walking around delusional. And that delusion is I'm recruiting other people into that delusion and then I'm, I'm not even able to have regular conversations. I can't even vent my frustrations because if I vent my frustrations, I'm putting those vibrations into the atmosphere and then the universe is going to return more things to complain about. So you get deep in it. it. I call it the secret cycle, right? Where you can't think anything negative. You can't have critical conversations. You can't speak anything negative. You can't watch the news. You can't read anything negative because once you switch from that frequency that you're trying to be on and you you entertain a little bit of negativity, it now takes you off that frequency and now you're repelling what you once wanted and now you're attracting what you don't want. So it's just it's this whole mess that it gets you that it gets you into. And I carried that mess with me into Christianity. This is why I was also so susceptible to the prosperity gospel was because here I'm I'm hearing these prosperity preachers like a Joel Osteen talk about the power of I am. And it just no red flags went off in my mind. No, uh, you know, the spidey senses were not tingling. Um, and it, it, it wasn't until I fell flat on my face, Doreen, where my business just just almost evaporated. The company got frauded $150 million in China and checks went from really good to non-existent. And I almost lost everything, but it was at that time that God brought me into a, a good church where I was around people who actually were trying to walk the walk and not just a Sunday service Christian where, you know, I was going to Hillsong uh, in New York City where it was motivational speech. You come out there ready to chase your dreams, but don't know anything about the gospel. But you think in your head, well, well, God's got my back and my dream chasing. And that's the group that I went with. So we were going to church on Sunday and, and sinning right again on on Monday. You know, it wasn't until I fell flat on my face and 
uh, as I'm falling flat on my face, I'm looking at my relationship with God because I trusted in Christ as my Lord and Savior. I did. I I knew that that's the only way to heaven because I went through a whole lot of apologetics. I knew apologetics, but I didn't know scripture, mm-hmm. right? I knew why you should believe in Christ, but I didn't know scripture. Yeah. So I was confused. I, I had faith that Christ is my Savior, but I had no idea what a real relationship with God was like. I was under the impression that because I ha- I'm now in right standing with God, I'm justified with God, that the rest of my life is going to be peachy keen because that's what the prosperity gospel preaches. And when you hear that, it also allows you to agree. With, it allows you to bring the law of attraction into it because it seems like there's no difference. Doreen, I was so into it that I remember talking to somebody I remember where I was, I was outside of my uncle's deli and I was helping somebody with some problems in life. And here I am telling him that, you know, everything is energy. And I'm a Christian telling him everything is energy. Your thoughts create your reality and all of this stuff. And this is why Jesus was able to walk through walls because he knew how quantum physics and all this stuff really worked. And I'm sure at some level, you know, Jesus does know how quantum physics works because he put it all together. He holds it all together. But that's not how I was explaining it. I'm I'm mixing both mm-hmm. without yeah. even realizing that I'm I'm participating in new age spirituality. I'm just thinking it's science. So this is how it can it can really bleed in and get a whole grip on your life. And you're completely oblivious to it. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that so much. The when I was first saved, I was mixing and didn't realize it as well. And, and that's tough to realize, very humbling. And one of the things that mostly bothers me about the law of attraction and that mind control that you articulated where you're not allowed to have any negative thoughts, like you said, you can't watch the news. If anyone starts to say anything that seems negative, you put your hands in your ear and you say, la, 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 or you say, Louise Hay had an affirmation. We would say that might be true for you, but not for me. Yeah, and, I've heard that one. Yeah. And just cancel, clear, delete. We would say, you know, just we were so afraid that any negative speech would uh, make us be cursed and have bad things happen to us. So uh, the but the worst part about that was that the gospel is viewed as negative yeah. to those who follow the law of attraction. So they they immediately dismiss the part that seems negative. It's the good news. Our Lord and Savior died for us, but he rose. God rose him from the dead. He resurrected. He's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father. He will return to judge us all. And and so, but to get to there, you have to realize that you're a sinner. And that I just couldn't handle at all. I was told since childhood that I was perfect, whole, and complete in God's image and likeness. God's not a sinner, so therefore I'm not a sinner. So I thought that born again evangelical Christians were asleep, yeah. un- unaware to the fact that we're we're perfect, whole, and complete. In fact, I remember in my groups, New Age groups, when we would sing "Amazing Grace," we would change the lyrics where it said "to save a wretch like me." We would never say "wretch like me" because that's wow. a negative affirmation. I can't remember what we said, but same it was of course self glory <laughs> that we always say. Yeah, yeah, but. Ha- you know, I heard the gospel throughout my life. Looking back, I didn't think I did when I was first saved, but I did. And and one of the people who shared the gospel was my brother Ken, who was saved twenty years before me. And he, and we were at a party at my house, and there was a lot of my new age friends there. And he and his wife Jan started to share the gospel at the party, pub, pub, you know, not secretly to all of us. And I was horrified. I was so mad at them because. It seemed like they were throwing shade on the party, but that's the, that's the devil's, he's an evil genius to Teflon coat people, uh, to not hear the gospel and to make it foolishness to them, uh, because it seems negative. Yeah. Did did you have experiences like that? So there's a, there's a story. I got two stories from what you were just saying, right? So I was never presented the gospel uh, at uh, when I was at Hillsong, it was like they would just say, you know, let Jesus into your heart, let him into your life. I, I, he died for your sins, but it, it didn't, you know, it didn't register. It wasn't until I was at an MLM training event, and there's this guy, David Peach, right? He was the first Christian that I met that was, you know, by the book. Uh, he, he was the 
when, when I was caught up in the prosperity gospel, he was the one who told me how to actually read the Bible in context, right? But Sunday, they let us do um, church service, right? And he got up there and preached the gospel. And I didn't put my faith in Christ at that point. But it was my first time hearing you're a sinner. Jesus died for your sins. Put your trust in his finished work on the cross. He He died. He rose again. He's fully man, fully God. And the only way to the Father is through him. The You have to transfer your trust from whatever it is you're trusting in out here and put your trust in the finished work of Christ on that cross. Nothing else will save you. So simple. So simple. And nobody has said this to me. It, it was but that it, it planted a seed in my mind. So when I went through all the apologetics and I went through trying to figure this thing out and, and wrestle with it, that was in the back of my mind. And then, of course, I was able to just look up what the gospel is. But another story I'll tell you, I was just in Orlando. My wife's family lives in Orlando. So whenever we're there, wherever I go, I always try to visit one of my friend's churches. Right. And uh, my friend John Adams, he's a YouTube creator uh, as well. I, I went to his church. Uh, a few times when I was down there, but they had this Saturday event where they bus in homeless, uh, they bus in the homeless for um, clothes and they get a free meal and they share the gospel with them, with them. And I got to volunteer at that event. But one thing John said to me that really stood out to me, he's like, John, preaching the gospel to these people is so easy because you don't have to convince them that they're sinners. They know. And it was just a, a a short sentence and we he moved on with the conversation but then when i was there in it and i'm i'm watching people respond to the gospel i'm just like man these are these are the people that if we were in you know uh really in law of attraction in that mode and in no negativity around me these are people that it's like no get away from me get away from me right? Because we have this view of ourselves. We think that they are attracting that life to them, right? That they're just, they're not addicted to drugs. They're not, they didn't uh, hit a string of bad luck and, and, and fell flat on their face. They're not just going through a hard season that they that they could pull themselves out of. No, they attracted that to them. I remember Bob Proctor, when he was being interviewed by ABC, um, they asked him, they were like, Bob, the, the country of Darfur, the children are starving out there. Have they attracted starvation to them? And Bob's response was, well, I think the country has. And to Bob's credit, I, I can appreciate him uh, following the law of attraction to its logical conclusion and, and admitting that the law of attraction could be responsible for a whole entire country starving. But it's just it's just so wrong. Mm -hmm. To think that way, to, to look at somebody who is in these situations and be like, yep, that's their fault. If they only knew about the law of attraction, their life would be better. They'd be driving in a Bentley. And so when I was in there in that moment, and I'm watching all these people respond. That was just ringing in my head. You don't have to tell these people that they're sinners. They know. And I wish that was true for all of us, where I, as jacked up as I was, I didn't want to hear anybody telling me that I was a sinner mm -hmm. or that I was in need of a savior or or whatever. I wanted to live in my sin and have my own moral code in which I couldn't even live up to my moral code, but I would judge you based on my moral code and think that since I'm doing better than you, therefore I can't be the worst sinner. So if God exists, dude should let me in. Like that was my mentality. And then I also thought, well, even if he does exist, I'm probably going to hell. It's like these conflicting views, but I just wish that people had that perspective of I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And in the new age that, you know, they, they talk about no one's coming to save you. You are your own savior. Uh, and underlying all of that is you are God mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the New Age uh, also says that you go to heaven for being a good person. And you and I were both involved with charitable works, of which I boasted daily on social media when I would rescue an animal or donate to some place or volunteer. There'd be a big picture of me on yeah, yeah. my social media. Look at what I'm doing. I'm a good person. And of course, the Bible tells us that the right hand should not know what the left hand's doing. We should do right. our good works in secret. But it was all because of this belief that if you're if you're good enough, you do good works, that of course you're going to heaven. 
works based and it's not on our works. We are saved by God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ, period. His work is finished. Of course, once we're saved, we want to do good works, but we certainly don't boast about them. Yeah. And there's a, so there's a, also a thin line that I, that I say, I think that sometimes because I do work in Guatemala, right. And one of the things that I have to do is build awareness to the work. Otherwise we can't uh, lead the trips. Otherwise we can't do it. So I think your heart position is also important as well, because we are to be salt and light on the earth. Right. So, and to, to be a lamp on a hill that shines and I don't, I'm very cautious of how I post my pictures, right? I'm not like like a hey, homeless guy with a with my selfie camera right yeah. there, like yo, I just gave this dude some money. But I I do post pictures of the work that we do in Guatemala simply because we need to build awareness to it. Otherwise, the schools don't get built, mm -hmm. you know. So I think so. It's not about you, exactly, exactly. Right. So that's what I was getting to, and yeah. I'm not trying to say like, oh yeah, look at me do it, and I'm doing it, and it's not yeah. about me. That's how good I am at doing it. No, that's not what I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to say. That's the old uh, I, stuff. I just want people <laughs> to hear, uh, to hear, because th sometimes they overcorrect in a way in, in which they're like, well, I can't tell people about this code drive that I'm doing then because then I'm going to look like I'm boasting, right? Like, no, if you're doing a code drive, if you're doing a toy drive, if, if especially if you're church, we're always collecting something, right? We got to tell people that we're collecting it. So there's a difference between promoting in order to gain some resources for the people in need. And then there's a difference between that and promoting to promote yourself. Right. It's all glory to God. We're in the new age. It's all glory to me. Right. And well, because you are God. So. Oh my goodness. It's, it's so crazy. So you had mentioned one of the inspirational authors, and that was something I was very involved in, in the new age. I think you were too. Uh, Napoleon Hill, oh, yeah. Brian Tracy, uh, Think and Grow Rich, Catherine Ponder, Stuart Wilde, who I knew before he died, and all these, these different um, books. Oh, also the um, uh, John Randolph Price and his wife, uh, who had a, the Abundance book that I was very much involved in. And, and I, I regret that I promoted it to people who came to my workshops, but it was all about um, the think and grow rich. And yep, that's the number one. Yeah. Right the kind of, so still people still write to me about that, John, and they're surprised to hear that. And Norman Vincent Peale, I was big into him because he seemed to be Christian yep. because he would, he, he said that you can think your congregation to be full and, and a lot of these things seem to work. I remember when I was a new uh, public speaker, I would use Norman Vincent Peale's visualizations yep. to imagine having a standing room only audience and it would work. And so we should talk about that. This stuff, like Napoleon Hill, it does work, but at what cost? And is it smoke and mirror from the demons? Yeah. So one thing about Napoleon Hill, uh, he's, his whole foundation is the, the foundation of all his work is Think and Grow Rich, in, in which he claims to have met Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, and Andrew Carnegie gave him this task of speaking with all of these, the richest people in the world, and he didn't have to pay him because from what he learns from these rich people, he'll be able to generate income and all of this stuff. But if you look at, uh, I, I believe it was Andrew Carnegie's biographer says that there's no evidence that Napoleon Hill even met Andrew Carnegie. So when you couple that allegation with some of the scams and, and scandals that Napoleon Hill has been caught in throughout his whole entire life, it's like this is the guy that we're basing our whole entire worldview on, this whole think and grow rich, when the, the premise of that book is he met with Andrew Carnegie and then the Andrew Carnegie's biographer is like, nah, that, that didn't happen. So the, the scheming runs deep. You know, it, it really does. Now, as far as things working, so there's a few factors that I've noticed and we'll, we'll go with the practical factors first, right? So when you visualize something, it, it's been proven that if you're a baseball player and you visualize the home run and you run through it in your mind over and over and over, it's it's adding to your practice, right? So it's it will help you when it comes time to swing the bat and actually hit the ball. So that's a practical use of visualization. Also, when you when you visualize, you know, sticking within the sports, 
it can make you feel more confident because you've gone over it. It's it's just like thinking about something for a long time, like going over it and reviewing it a, it's, a lot. It's, it's basically, pl- it's planning, isn't it? Yes, it's pl- planning exactly. Planning ahead, yeah. Yep. So practically, that's good. And then also, you know, it's difficult to have conversations with successful people who believe in the law of attraction because it's like it's almost like they're blind to the amount of work that they put in. Being in the MLM industry, I watched some people go from broke to multi-millionaire in a short period of time and then go attribute that to the law of attraction. And I'm like, bro, I watched you do like 15 presentations a day, travel all over the East Coast, building teams here and going there and flying here and doing this, you know, sleepless nights, leaving your wife and kids at home to go do this. And then when you actually achieve all of the 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 rewards of your hard labor, you're going to say, yeah, it was the law of attraction. It's like, what? That's not what the law of attraction says. The law of attraction doesn't say, think about it and then work for it and the universe will give it to you. No, that's something that you have to add to it. Work is necessary in order to see results, but it, it just bothers me that they'll do all this work and then attribute their success to the law of attraction. So that's one thing, right? Practically speaking, it can help because if you're thinking that the universe is going to give you this stuff, it can make working a lot easier because you have this positive outlook on it. And as long as I stay moving forward and I stay doing this and I stay motivated, it can yield some better results. It's, it always yields better results if you're a more positive person to be around. You become a more attractive person to other people, not attractive in the sense that you're pulling them in with your vibe, but attractive in that if you are doing business, people need to want to work with you in order for your business to be successful. So being more positive is a good thing and it can have an impact on your life. Now, the other thing, and my my friend David Peach pointed this out, he says, I think the law of attraction does work for some people because as we know, Satan is the God of this world or this age, right? And he will give you all these worldly desires if you just do anything but worship the true son of God. It, it, it's you worship anyone but Jesus Christ. You could worship yourself. You could worship your possessions. You could worship all of this. So the devil can hand you everything that you want as long as you don't attribute any of that to Jesus and say, wow, Jesus, thank you for giving it. You No, you attribute it to yourself because when you believe in the law of attraction, that's you doing everything and you are the God who is creating this universe. And it's almost, it's almost a guarantee that once somebody becomes financially successful in any area, they're coming up with some sort of course. And within that course, there's going to be some mindset training, leaning you into the law of attraction. And that's how they're going to, that's how they're going to claim they got everything is by changing their mindset. And then the universe gave it all to them. So I do believe that my friend David Peach is right, that the devil and his minions of demons do orchestrate some things to keep you distracted. We get this, um, we get this confused sometimes. We hear devil or demons, and we automatically assume physical or emotional suffering would involve being around them. But that's not the case. You and I know, both from experience, that entering a new age environment can feel really good sometimes. Not as Christians anymore, but when we were non-Christians, you walk into a yoga studio, you walk into a meditation session, you walk into a Buddhist temple, and you're like, wow, I can feel the positivity here. That's how the devil gets you. He masquerades as an angel of light. If he just showed up in your life like, hey, knock, 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 it's me, the devil. I'm here for your soul. And he looks like this crazy, scary, demonic monster. That's not a good strategy for anybody who is waging war, especially a war on the mind and the heart and the spirit uh, against God's people. So the devil does and the demons do orchestrate these things for you to attribute your success to the law of attraction, because then what are you going to do? You're going to recruit other people to it. And if he can keep you distracted in your bliss, he can damn you for eternity. John, you're so right on. I mean, I often call de- the devil a sugar daddy. Yes. <laughs> he, because he he gave me all kinds of rewards when I was unknowingly working for him, uh, thinking I was working for God that whole time as a new age teacher before God so graciously saved me. 
And one of the things I really related to in your book was this whole law of attraction teaching to act as if. I remember yeah. Deepak Chopra teaching that at one of his workshops that I attended because we toured together for so long. And it just made so much sense. And and I remember also one of the times I was on Oprah um, and I thought I manifested it through the law of attraction because I bought a suit that I thought, and I, and I hung the suit on the wall and I thought, I'm going to wear that on Oprah someday. And I kept visualizing myself wearing the suit on Oprah. And then I did. And then when I did, she came up to me and she said, oh, that's the perfect suit for my show. And I kind of told her the story and she laughed. Ha ha. But one of the things that you said in your book that I so related to was that when you act as if and you buy things for your next level, you can go broke very easily. I left, the, I made a lot of money in the new age, but I left the new age in debt that we're still paying off. What is it? Almost seven years later, we're still paying off the old debts because we acted as if we lived above our income. As much as we were making, more was going out. And I really think the devil does that as indentured servants. If you look at these these videos of rock stars, where they end up in gutters or old hotel rooms with wine, you know, they're drunk, uh, yeah. they, they end up broke. And and people who win the lottery, they end up broke. And that's that's basically, if my husband hadn't got a good job right away, um, we were going to end up broke. And, you know, my my parents left us a little bit, but um, it's just by God's providence that that whole foolishness of act as if, to help me denounce this for people who are watching who think that that's something to aspire to. I... I remember uh, we had this BMW bonus, right? And uh, I I wanted to get the BMW so bad, so bad. This was long before I was a Christian. And I got it. I got it really quickly. That was $600 a month that they gave me towards that BMW, as long as I maintained, um, you know, the revenue coming in, uh, the, the volume, right? And I did. I did that for a very long time. So this is how act as if can just backfire and it backfires every time. But here's here's a real life scenario that happened to me. I'm driving this 2010 BMW. Nothing's wrong with it. Absolutely nothing. It's got a heated steering wheel for the wind winter. It's got X drive. It's a great car. Super great car. But I wanted to level up. And I'm looking at all these cars that the the people that are above me, the the I wouldn't say above me, but that were further along in me in business that they had nicer cars. So in my mind, I'm like, all right, the next car bonus is a thousand dollars a month. That was the next car bonus. So I'm like, I could do that. I could definitely do that. I could get to that car bonus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get a car right now. And I went and got a 650, uh, M package convertible drop top BMW, that was $1,200 a month car payment. Doreen, I could have bought a house with a $1,200 a month payment. It, everything was fine for a while. I was doing great. I was living in Florida. I, you know, Everything's moving. I hit that level that I was going to. So the, to me, this is self-fulfilling prophecy. The act as if is now working because boom, I hit the level, getting the $1,000 a month car bonus. All of a sudden, remember I told you earlier, fraud in China. And now here I am. My income goes from way up here to minuscule. And I'm just struggling to just pay for this BMW that I didn't even need. I only got it to, to show how good I was doing. And was I doing good? Yes, I was, but good in a, in a quote unquote worldly sense. We know that good in a worldly sense can, can be very damaging spiritually. But here I am just struggling to not only pay the BMW, but maintain an image, this, this image that everything is fine because you, you can't, you can't tell people that things are bad. Not only can you not tell people that things are bad because, uh, you could mess up the frequency you're on or whatever, but you don't want to tell people things are bad because you've created this life and there's people who doubted you and your ability to create this life. And, and now you want to like stunt on the haters, right? So this is me. Now I'm, I'm a Christian at this point, still thinking this stupidly. And then it was right at that time when I, when I told you earlier that 
I, I almost lost everything. All I had at that time was my BMW, my mom, and Jesus. That was it. And that was not in any particular order because that was really backwards. <laughs> but, you know, at that time, I went to go stay with my mother in Connecticut and five minutes away from her was a church. And I got invited from one of my friends to go to that church. That was the last time she ever went to that church. But God used that brought me brought me there and I got around people who were actually living out their walk with Christ and that's when everything changed and it was so those people weren't acting as if they had a relationship with God they did have an actual genuine relationship with God and I didn't want to act as if anymore I wanted that genuine relation relationship with God and getting around those people, your your environment influences you, right? I'm actually writing a, another book right now. I don't know why I do this to myself. I must love, uh, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's a grueling process. Yes, it is. <laughs> but and in it, I'm I'm talking about Christian positivity. What does that actually mean, right? We have this confusion that uh, this this misconception that positivity means feeling good. And negativity means feeling bad. A positive environment is a is an environment that makes you feel good. A negative environment is something that makes you feel bad. But that's not what positivity and negativity is when it comes to Christianity. A positive environment is any environment that brings you closer to God and keeps you from sin. A negative environment, no matter how good it feels to be in it, is any environment that pushes you further from God and closer to sin. So when I got around an actual, genuine, positive environment, it it helped wash me of, of sin. You know, I know I'm already washed through the blood of Christ, but in my sanctification process, now sin starts falling off of me. And I, I already had, a, you know, inclination to stop doing certain things that I was doing. I would be mid-sin thinking to myself, John, you shouldn't be doing this. Why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing this. That never happened to me before. And, but it wasn't until those, those thoughts actually became reality of John, you shouldn't be doing this. That didn't become reality until I got around people who were walking out their faith. And I was, I realized that wow, people do exist that actually walk out their faith and, and people do exist that exist that aren't just Sunday service Christians and people do exist that aren't like this caricature that I had of Christians in my mind where I thought they were weirdos. And these are just regular people walking out their life with Christ. Yeah. Praise the Lord for faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, godly men and women. And it's like the old saying that Christians are sometimes the only Bible that people will read. Right. And the hypocrisy that goes on in the church really shipwrecks people's faith. So I want to talk with you, John, about vision boards. And I want to read this verse from Habakkuk 2.2. And it's on the screen. And it says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Now, there are some so called Christians who have videos saying that Habakkuk 2 2 is the Bible's way of telling us to make vision boards. I'm sure, like me, that you were involved with using vision boards. The secret promotes it. It, it was something that my actually my parents were both passed taught us to do when when we were kids my um my father was self-employed and we needed a new car because it broke so he he went to the toy store and bought a, a hot wheels die cast metal ford pinto that was for some reason I, what he wanted i've In done this... that too i'm sorry Doreen, but i did that too i bought a, a stupid lamborghini toy and i put it on in my <laughs> yes. in my car so i could see it every single time i got in my car that's so funny well, that's that's what dad would do so he he took this brown it was a ford pinto and he painted it the shade of brown he wanted and he put it on top of our television set and he made my brother ken and i and my mom uh all sit there and he guided it and I, we're little kids we're like six or seven he had us close our eyes and imagine that ford pinto being in the driveway he had us imagining what it smelled like the the roar of the pinto engine you know the everything imagine sitting in it and and then it was there it was like in our driveway it seemed like a month later because dad got some sort of extra job and so i was raised this way with visualization and vision boards and i used them and it seemed like things happened the devil being a sugar daddy, as we've discussed. 
Um, but this is not something that the Bible teaches, is it? And this is part of the devil's trap and the law of attraction lies. Yeah. So what's interesting is this is my first time ever hearing that verse from uh, Habakkuk. My first time ever hearing somebody really? use that as as verification that the Bible teaches vision boards. I, I guess I was out of law of attraction and prosperity gospel stuff. I guess I was out before I got deep enough into it <laughs> that people were going that far back to grab something in order to to prove this worldview. But just it it just lets you use common sense, right? What common sense Christianity is important. God says, stay away from witchcraft, stay away from sorcery, stay away from Satan, stay away from anything that's that even resembles that. Stay away from it. And then we think that these things that are that are created by New Agers and, and people who are just indoctrinated into Luciferian worldviews, we think that we can use something created by them to somehow activate the blessings of God or something like that. It, it, it blows my mind or that by us looking at a picture and thinking about what's in that picture, that we can manifest that into our reality by simply looking at a picture and visualizing it. Now, there's nothing wrong with having your goals on a board or something like, uh, you know, written down to remind yourself of what you're working towards for your family or for your ministry or, or, or you know, for your church or, or something like that. But if you have a, a, like what I had, I had this vision board of Lamborghinis, Batmobiles, because I really wanted a Batmobile. You know, I wanted a, a Batmobile. I wanted a, a mansion. I wanted a, all of that, right? Uh, I had pictures of me when I was, you know, when I was on steroids. I had pictures of me from when I was on steroids thinking that I could visualize my my perfect body. You know, in the secret, they say, if you just don't think fat thoughts, that, that you can eat whatever you want and be however you want. I forgot they said that. That's crazy. Yeah. I, remember, I remember Wayne Dyer saying that at, at, we'd have group dinners and he would say that. He was a little overweight too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I, I used to really like uh, Wayne Dyer at, at one mm -hmm. point, but um, anyway, so yeah. here's the thing. If you got your goals on your, on your board, I'm saying all that to say this, if you have goals, like a, a post-it with your goal on the board, uh, uh, on your wall, just to remind you of, yes, that's what I'm working towards. You can even look at it like a to-do list. Hey, take out the garbage. That's a goal. That's on, is, is me posting a post-it to remind me to take out the garbage on Thursday. Is that a vision board? No, you can't trip into a vision board, you know, but if you're creating something with all of these worldly things on it, and then thinking that by looking at it, you are going to br somehow bring them to you. You're trying to override God. You're, you're trying to override his, sovereignty mm -hmm. and essentially it, it boils back to you being your own god you creating your reality by using these satanic tools that are at your disposal and yeah. the reason we say they're satanic it's not us crazy christians that are just like oh man new age spirituality it's demonic blah, blah, blah. people think that but it's it's not us that say it's satanic it's satanists who say that new age spirituality is satanic. Anton LaVey, uh, he has this whole message about how Satanists should reclaim all of the new age practices that have been stolen from, paraphrasing obviously, that have been, uh, they, they've stolen them from, they, they should reclaim these things like meditation, guided meditation, uh, uh, astral projection, pro projection. They should reclaim those to where they rightfully belong because all new age spirituality is, is trying to play the devil's game without using his infernal name. That is a paraphrase of a quote from Anton LaVey, the guy who wrote the satanic Bible. So it's not just us saying this, it's actual Satanists who believe that new age spirituality, that, that they are Satanists as well. They just uh, refuse to acknowledge it. Yeah. It's Satanism light. <laughs> and it's still Satanism. And and it's, you know, the vision boards and all that, that's conjuring. Yes. And conjuring is witchcraft. And yes. like you said, it it may not be God's will. It probably isn't. And not that God wants us to all be paupers. That was one of my thoughts I used to believe. Yeah, that yeah. if I followed God's will, he'll have me living in a trailer in Barstow, California or something. I thought that you know, too. On, on welfare. And so I better take it in my own hands because I want to, I want to have a, a high life. And I did, but it, it the other thing is 
when you attract or so-called manifest all that, it doesn't fill you up. I was still seeking, even though I had the big 50 acre ranch in Hawaii, the, the career, you know, everything that you could want materially, I was still looking for the secret, for fulfillment, for inner peace. It, it That's not through materiality. Right. You're trying to, um, I believe it's uh, Ecclesiastes that says, God has put eternity in the heart of man. And here we are trying to fill what's set on eternity with anything that, that's not eternal. The only thing that can fulfill uh, that can truly fulfill what is set on the eternal is something from the eternal and someone from the eternal. And that someone is Jesus Christ. You can't, Amen. you can't fill what's set on eternity with anything temporal. You just can't do it. It doesn't matter how much of it you consume. It, the more of it you consume, the more it consumes you. There's only peace in Christ. I, I wish I could just give this peace to people. I really do. I had my mom uh, ask me one day uh, talking about somebody that we both love. And she's just like, you know, John, I wish you could just give him the peace that you have. And I'm like, I, I can't give him Jesus. I, I, there's no, there's no thing that I'm doing, mom. There's no, th I'm not trying to, to have this peace. I'm not trying to, um, I, I don't have a vision board of things that make me peaceful. I don't have a 10 steps to peace that my peace comes from a person and I can't just give that person to somebody. I can tell you about the person. I can try to convince you why you should be in relationship with this person, but I can't force you to start a relationship with this person. That person is not only a person, he's also God. So there's no, that's where peace is. That's the only place that you can find it. And it, I just truly wish that I could just, you know, I, I sell this book. I wish I could just like package peace and be like, here you go. You know, I, I just wish that I could do it, but we can't. And, and, you know, as well as I do, it's chasing the wind all of that materialistic stuff. And yeah. there's nothing There's nothing wrong with making sure that your bills are paid. You know, we don't need to live in poverty as I used to think as well. Yeah, the love of money is the root of all evil. And when people say, well, you know what, John and Doreen, I don't want a mansion or a Lamborghini. I just want to pay my bills. So I'm just going to do, use the law of attraction for a little bit. What they don't realize is there's no such thing as a little bit of going into new age deception because you'll you'll always crave more when you yes. go into that path. That's why I call it the gateway drug to spiritual heroin because it's it opens you up yeah. to this whole new world. And here's the thing: you're going to be high when you start practicing the law of attraction. It's just you're going to feel invigorated with life because you now have this new perspective, and a, and a, per, a new perspective in life gives you new. Uh, renewed energy. You know, you're like, wow, I, I finally have hope. If this thing is real and I can attract all of this stuff, man, that's exciting stuff. And you could only be excited for so long. Then the excitement wears off. And when it wears off, what they tell you is, you know, here you are indoctrinated into this worldview that tells you if you come down from that high, you are not only coming off that high, but that frequency that you need to be on in order to attract abundance. So now you start playing these mental games with yourself of like, man, I'm not as excited as I was. I know this is, this is no good. I'm going to start attracting things that I don't want. So you go seeking somebody who is better at this than you. And they're just better at it surface level, like appearance wise, you can't be better at sinning than someone else. All sin is sin, right? But when you, when you are unaware of what it is you are doing, you you now chase the fix like i'm trying to fix this so it's kind of like a fix which is why i call it spiritual heroin because you're you're chasing spiritual high after spiritual high and then all of a sudden you're you're down the rabbit hole so far that you're paying james ray $10,000 to go sit in a sweat lodge and where three people die in sedona arizona yeah. you know this is this is the this is what's at the end it's, that's not even the end. What's at the end of walking down this path is hell. Yeah. And, and that's the most dangerous part because you chase spiritual high after spiritual high, essentially trying to attain enlightenment and peace. And you just end up on the wrong side of eternity, unenlightened and definitely with no peace. So true.
My guest today has been John Clash, and I've got a link in the description to his book, The Law of Attraction, A Gateway Drug to Spiritual Heroin. As he explained, it's this addictive cycle of wanting more and more and more. Uh, King Solomon talked about that in his book, Ecclesiastes. This is definitely a book that if you've got tangled up in the law of attraction or you know someone who has, this is a great resource to add to your library. John, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And just God bless you on your ministry and also on writing your new book. That's exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I'm praying it's a it's a quick, it's a quick process. Hopefully we'll manifest it or something like that, you know. <laughs> There's well, thank you. Thank you again. My best to Gio, and I appreciate your time today. All right. God bless, Doreen. God bless.